Um, so welcome to another Conversations with the Past. That's our monthly lecture series here at the Chapman. Uh, some of you I recognize, others I don't. Uh, my name is Becca Smell, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the Chapman Museum. And I'm so grateful that we have such a great turnout for tonight because it is a fascinating topic that we're going to be discussing. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Rachel Greenfield. Rachel is an independent scholar who is writing a biography on Mrs. Charles B. Knox, who was the president of Knox Skeleton from 1908 to 1947. And tonight's presentation is going to showcase some of that research, correct? Right. Uh, Rachel is a graduate of Vassar College. She received her MBA from Harvard Business School. Her career as a historian actually follows 40 years as a publishing and digital digital business executive, which included positions as uh, an ebook company company entrepreneur and the executive running the publishing division of Martha Stewart Living on the Media. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel and her presentation. That's right, buddy. Um, well, good evening. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about Aspic, Gelatin, and Rose Knox, the woman who made Knox Gelatin and herself famous. So let's start with an important question. How many of you remember tomato aspic? <laughs> All right, you got a bunch of hands. There you go. Uh, how many of you still make it? All right, here we go. Um, what about one of these? Fruit Bavarian cream, chicken mousse, perfection salad. There we go. Or the multitude of other things that perhaps you or your mother may or still make with Knox gelatin. Well, meet Mrs. Charles B. Knox as drawn by her son, Jim. <laughs> Mrs. Knox, as she was known to both the public and her friends, ran Knox Gelatin, as you heard, from 1908 to 1947. She was the best known female business owner and executive in the United States in the early 1920s. She lived 50 miles down the road from here in Johnstown, which was the home of Knox Gelatin. Mrs. Knox has been forgotten, but her gelatin, with all of its myriad uses, certainly lives on and it occupies a significant place in the culinary history of the first half of the 20th century. This evening, we'll discuss gelatin, its uses, and the story of the dynamic, resilient, practical, and really superb businesswoman, Mrs. Knox, who put it on the map, and in the process, set an example for the way that women could work in business, which I submit is still present in women's minds today. Now, Rose Markworth began life in Mansfield, Ohio in 1857, which is before the Civil War. This is what the house that she lived in for much of her childhood and teenage years looks like today. And here is a picture of young Rose staring watchfully out of the camera with her mother, Amanda. While Rose's family did have a girl in the house who um, did the heavy housework, Rose did learn how to cook. Her father was a pharmacist in Mansfield who got rich selling patent medicines. And he then sold his pharmacy, and he went into real estate. And after the panic of 1873, he lost his properties, and he lost his money. And Rose, at age 18, left Ohio with her family and moved to Gloversville, New York, which at the time was known as the glove-making capital of the country. It was a smelly town full of leather pipe tanneries, small glove factories, and polluted streams like the one that you can see here and it produced 90% of all the leather gloves in the United States. After six years of stitching decorative backing on the back of gloves part-time, Rose married Charles Knox in 1883. Charles was an exuberant, energetic salesman from a prominent local family, and the couple spent the first six years of their married life, I believe, mainly in Brooklyn, which became Charles's base of operation from, for his knit goods sales uh, business, which is what he did traveling throughout the country. In 1890, Rose and Charles moved back to Johnstown to be near Charles's family. They had their first son, also named Charles, in 1888. And Rose's parents had both, who had also lived in Mansfield, um, also lived in Gloversville, had, uh, had both died right around the time of her marriage. Mrs. Knox lived the life of a traditional wife caring for her children at home, cooking and managing on the allowance that Charles gave her every month. The family settled in a small row house in Johnstown, also a glove-making town, three miles from Gloversville. 
their second son, Jim, was born in 1892. And a third uh, a daughter, Helene, was born in 1895 when Mrs. Knox was 39, but she never lived to see her first birthday. So Charles found it, uh, Knox Gelatin in 1891. It was initially a side business to his knit glove sales, but it very rapidly within a year became a full-time business. Now, instant granulated gelatin was a new, a really new invention. It had been patented as a food product, but not sold as a food product, by Peter Cooper in 1845. Cooper was a wealthy glue manufacturer, and gelatin is basically purified glue. In the 1800s, a woman who wanted to make gelatin before the invention of instant gelatin would extract collagen from animal bones by first making and keeping a hot fire, remember, we're in the mid-1800s, making cheesecloth bags, separating the bones from the animal, boiling the bones for most of the day, letting the liquid settle, skimming it, boiling it again, straining it in the cheesecloth bags to remove impurities. Actually, that whole process might be done about four times. Um, and clarifying the stock with egg whites. After the boiling and the skimming and the straining of the bag, then you had to flavor the gelatin, and then it had to be dried and chilled. So it was a really laborious process that was really fit only for the wealthy, who had the servants who could spend the time doing it. So gelatin became associated with fancy upper class desserts or wedding cakes. Or here comes the rain. Um, a devoted mother might make gelatin for a sick child or an adult who needed a bland diet. Now, gelatin was an ideal product to be made in Johnstown exactly because it was a byproduct of, um, it was made from cattle bones, and the cattle bones were a byproduct of, of the uh, glove manufacturers. So this is a picture of Knox's first factory which is a four-story wooden building in Johnstown, which looked like all the other glue and leather factories in town. Now, if the bones and the gelatin were not cleaned and boiled and skimmed properly, then when the gelatin set, it looked cloudy and not clear. And as Charles Knox said in one of his early cookbooks, quote, a sickening odor will rise from it <laughs> and shows that the stock is not pure and is so unfit for food. Gelatin should dissolve quickly. Soak in cold water five minutes and then pour on boiling water, and it all should dissolve instantly. If it takes longer to dissolve, it is more of a gluey nature and should be used only in cabinet work. <laughs> in fact, for the first two years, Charles made his gelatin. He sold glue as well as gel. Um, most of Charles's first consumer ads for Knox gelatin, shown here, play to the worst stereotypes of blacks as servants. <clears throat> contrasting the color of their skin to assurances of Knox's transparent purity. Now, since the method of testing for bacteria in food really hadn't been invented, a woman could only judge if the gelatin could be used for cooking by its color or its odor. However, talking about purity by using these pictures is really important today, and it should have been then. Some of Charles's early gelatin actually was not fit to eat. It's alleged that he mixed confectioner sugar, with his gelatin, that he cut corners by using deer bones sometimes instead of cow bones. And sometimes, knowing the gelatin actually really wasn't totally pure, he put the bluish gelatin in the middle of the wooden barrel so that if the broker was testing the barrel of gelatin from either end, it would have the good gelatin, and then the bad stuff would be in the middle. Um, that lasted until 1894. Beginning in 1894, Charles started buying, stopped making his own gelatin, started buying his gelatin from outside vendors from Johnstown, Boston, and Switzerland, rather than making his own. He then packed the gelatin he bought at the Knox factory under the Knox name. Mrs. Knox, hang on a minute, did we not get, there we go. Mrs. Knox tested and wrote Knox's early recipes, first published, as, he, as you can see here, under her maiden name, Rose Markward in their signature cookbook, Dainty Desserts for Dainty People, which was published continuously from 1894 into the 1920s. And Mrs. Knox continued to keep her hands in recipe creation throughout her life. And Knox is credited with being the first company to popularize gelatin for everyday use. Now, as the country entered the 20th century, the number of domestic servants had dropped dramatically because women opted to go into factory work rather than be live-in domestics. Well, as a consequence, 
Laura, so Laura Shapiro, who's a historian, credits the word dainty, which was used by many companies in the 1890s and the early 1900s, with connoting femininity, and suggests the cookbook title probably implied that these were recipes fit for the lady of the house to make, implying that this kind of cooking was not going to be drudgery and hard work, and so it didn't matter that she had to do it on her servants. Mrs. Knox's cookbooks into the 1920s included information about how to set a table and how to serve a meal, all information that a woman might need if she's getting ready to serve a dinner. Her first recipes were mainly for jellies, grape, orange, banana, lemon, or coffee jelly, which should, quote, dissolve in the mouth instantly without chewing. <laughs> and jelly still has that unique property today. It melts, actually, it melts a little below your body temperature. So the minute it hits your mouth, you get that smooth melting sensation, and that's why. Knox's first cookbook had no illustrations, but later ones, which I'll show you, had abundant line drawings. From the beginning, Mrs. Knox offered many ways to create dessert dishes with dogs. Clear gels, whips, snows, chiffons, mousses, bavarians, cold souffles, and charlottes. All the recipes but two in the first cookbook were dessert. And of the 46 recipes, five of them included some kind of liquor, either brandy, sherry, champagne, or wine. By 1901, there were 67 recipes in dainty desserts, and 54 of them were sweet jellies or ice creams or other kinds of desserts. And the dainty desserts cookbook, as you can see, was in color with beautiful line drawings of the dishes along with the recipes. Now note these recipes don't look the way ours do now with the nice neat lists. While most of the recipes in the 1901 cookbook did have lists of ingredients first and then instructions, some of them did not. A few other interesting things to note, this was before electric refrigerators were invented, right? So recipes called for setting the mold on ice, on cracked ice, or in a cool place, and said it would take about two hours for the gelatin to set. Mrs. Knox's style of writing was conversational without too many details, which mirrored Fanny Farmer, who was also very popular then. And she had a very successful cookbook, and she was really the one who pioneered dishes with decorative shapes and a lot of color. And Mrs. Knox was in that tradition. So color was supplied by lemon juice, oranges, grape juice, paprika, sweet red pepper, or canned fruits like maraschino cherries or canned peaches. And the amount of sugar called for would vary from four cups of sugar in French dainties, which I have made, which is a very sweet candy cut, I swears, um, to a half a cup for strawberry fraps, which then used a pint of whipped cream and a cup of the fruit plus gelatin, eggs, and nuts. Though Charles advertised his gelatin to housewives in popular magazines and newspapers using the awful drawings that you just saw, he really focused most of his effort on grocers, who were at the time the gatekeepers to the woman shopping. You didn't just go to the store and pick what you wanted, but you went to the grocer and you said, I'd like gelatin, and he turned around from behind the counter and gave it to you. So food manufacturer marketed to the grocer. And Charles always had a new stud for the grocers. He loved horse racing, and he had his own horse, stable, horse racing stable called Rose Hill Stables, with horses that he named Gelatin Boy and Gelatin Queen. <laughs> and he raced the New York State racing circuit, including at least once a year in Glens Falls. Then in 1904, Charles ran a slogan contest, which offered the winning grocer, come up with the good slogan, you get $5,000 in cash. Wow. The equivalent of $175,000 of today's money, or you could get the fastest harness racing horse from the United States, whom Charles had already bought and renamed Knox's Gelatin King. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the grocery took cash. <laughs> Charles put the Knox name on everything from one of the first horses carriages in upstate New York to train cars to his own dirigible, which was flown in Syracuse as well as across the country at regional fairs from Seattle to St. Louis to New York. The couple prospered and started to build a 35-room mansion at the top of a hill in Johnstown, which is still there today. And in January 1900, when it was minus 20 degrees out, they moved in. With her boys now 8 and 12, Mrs. Knox started to leave her boys at home and travel with her husband on business for weeks at a time. 
She also became an active member of the women's group, a women's group in town, serving as president of the All Nine Study Club, which hosting luncheons, bridge playing, and meetings in her beautiful new home. All nine members researched and wrote 20 minute papers, which they gave to each other at their monthly meetings. In future years, the All Nines, even at least twice, sat through a 25 page paper on jelly and how it is made, <laughs> which Mrs. Knox wrote and gave to them, which included detail about the amount of calcium phosphate in bone and acid washing in the production process for Knox jelly. When she was in her late 80s, Mrs. Knox was still writing and giving papers on people like Madame Curie. I have that paper. Oops, hold on, that's backwards. This is forwards. There we go. At the turn of the 20th century, there were numerous small regional gelatin companies, and many sold unflavored gelatin like Knox, but others sold flavored gelatin. And the largest of those brands, no surprise, was Jell-O, whose revenues hit $1 million by 1906, which makes it five times larger than Knox at the time. In 1897, when Charles was already selling his granulated Jell-O, Orator Woodward, love that name, had bought the rights to a product which became Jell-O. Orator was located in Leroy, New York, which is 260 miles due west of here. As an already pre-sugared flavored product, Jell-O's pitch was that it was so easy that a child could make it. Coming in a time when, as we've said, servants were moving into factories and weren't in the house anymore, middle-class white American families were looking for something quick and easy to make. Jell-O had four flavors initially. It didn't require anything but water. And in a sense, it was America's first packaged dessert mix. So Jell-O didn't need to give cookbooks to its consumers. So instead, the company offered stories about girls who had adventures. And then in 1908, Charles Knox died. Charles put in his will that he wanted his wife to continue to run the company. However, at the time, women were not to be seen running big nationally branded food manufacturing companies. Even at the local level, women who did run businesses used either their husband's name or initials rather than their own. So though she actually did run the company from day one after her husband died, from an outside business perspective, Mrs. Knox kept herself invisible in Johnstown and in the rest of the country. And at first, she put out word that her oldest son, Charles, who's pictured here and was dead of tuberculosis by 1915, was running the company. And then later, on, as time went by, letters were signed only by the company name. Gelatin sales, however, had begun to boom. Because take, upon taking over, Mrs. Knox changed the Knox ads from that little black cook to ads that actually included a recipe and pictures of the dish that you could make and the orange Knox box. These ads appealed to housewives who were the ultimate consumer for um, the product. She advertised the jellies, puddings, ice cream, and sherbet recipes from her dainty desserts cookbook. And after three years, her sales had tripled from what they were when she took over the business. <laughs> and she began to build a bigger, much more hygienic factory to cope with the greater demand. Now, fun thing, do you see the two little cooks logo on the bottom of the ad on the right? There it is in bigger. Interestingly, in 1901, Charles had changed the Knox logo from that single black child to what you see here, which he trademarked, which is one white cook and one black cook. It's the only interracial corporate logo of, its, of that time that I've been able to find. And Knox used it on all its ads up until World War I and on its letterhead and its cookbooks into the 1930s. It's likely, I think, that the reason the logo was, which was used nationwide, is there as it was meant to evoke either the Irish servant that a white household in the North might have employed, or the black servant that a white household in the South might have employed. So here's Knox's new factory, which opened in February 1912. It had its own coal-driven power plant to provide power, heat, and light. The light also came streaming in from over 3,500 window panes. The factory was built to the latest standards of sanitary production at the time, which meant as much as possible that human hands didn't touch the gelatin as it flowed through the building, but instead they used machinery, some of which Knox held patents for. Now, this area of upstate New York was a very important food manufacturing area. Beechnut, about 60 miles from here in Kanajahari, 
was canning ham and condiments. Knox was doing Knox Jello, and Jello was in Leroy. And I don't know how many of you remember Junket, but Junket was in Little Falls, which is just 20 miles north of here. It's worth noting that Knox's new factory did not ever make gelatin. Mrs. Knox had continued to buy gelatin from outside suppliers. And starting in 1916, she bought her gelatin um, from a plant that she co-owned in Camden, New Jersey. And the production process in Camden, New Jersey was a long 14-week complicated process. My favorite statistic, they used 1,000 gallons of water to make one pound of gelatin. Yeah. Not surprisingly, the old factory in New Jersey is now a toxic waste dump. <laughs> um, here are pictures from 1913-1914 of the inside of the new factory. Rail cars from the Fonda, Johnston, Gloversville Steam Railroad line would pull directly to the factory, bringing the granulated gel into the building, and it would go up elevators on the outside of the building. And then from the top floor, it flowed into sifters, into hoppers that led to bag filling machines, where the gelatin was packed and each bag individually sealed. Then the packers, who were dressed all in white, of course, loaded the bags into the Knox gelatin boxes with these little small recipe books, both of which were printed in Johnstown. And they went automatically to a sealing machine and into containers and into shipping cases and down another chute to the shipping department where they went right onto the rail cars that had come to the factory. All the concrete walls were painted white, the floors were painted gray, and they were covered with thick rubber mats to quiet the noise. There were bathrooms on each floor with running water for hand washing and paper towels and individual drinking cups provided. The factory also had a lab for gelatin testing to the for standards of the purity of the day and advertising and executive offices. Um, one fun thing, if you look at the top right-hand picture, which shows the young boys working in the advertising department, <laughs> um, child labor was not regulated in New York State until 1916, and at that time, they just regulated the amount of overtime that the boys could work. So from 1908 to 1911, Mrs. Knox remained invisible in terms of the business world, though she was running the company. In 1911, Missing the business talk that she and her husband used to hear when they traveled the country, talking to brokers and grocers, she ventured out. And this is her first meeting as an invisible CEO. She attended the Specialty Manufacturers Association meeting at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. Now, she was always comfortable in her own skin. And she wrote and she asked to attend. They, Knox Gelatin had been a member for two years, and they were only two or three years old. Um, and the story of her attendance is really classic. For the morning session, the president seated her under a potted palm in the back of the room. If you look closely, I think you can see them. And the men glared at her, kept their coats on. At lunch, she got up and addressed the group. She said, take off your coats. Feel free to smoke. And after lunch, I'm going to sit up front by an open window. <laughs> well, the men reportedly gave her three cheers. And 13 years later, she was the first female director of the Grocery Manufacturers Association of America, which was the successor organization to this one. Note the um, fashionable ermine muff. Actually, there are multiple ermines that make up that muff in her lap. And there's also one on her hat with the feathers. Um, she dressed for this. Um, interestingly, in 1911, Mrs. Knox was not yet prepared to reveal herself to American consumers or grocers. So, Thanks, I believe, to the association president, who happened to be a vice president at Beechnut over in Kanajahari. The press coverage of the event, which went to grocers throughout the country, did not identify her as a widow, nor did it her identify her as president of Knox Jelly. But instead, it said she was there as, quote, a help meet to her husband, the Jelly King. We've been dead for three years. <laughs> Mrs. Knox would continue to remain invisible for another three years. And then in 1914, she decided that, as she later said to her women's club, the business needed personality. By that time, she figured out what positioning she was going to use to make sure that she would be admired and not dismissed for disclosing that she was a woman running a big national business. So she announced herself to three million white American club women and housewives via the pages of four national magazines, the biggest of which was the General Federation of Women's Clubs magazine, which you see here. Pictured is all, here is also the car that I believe Mrs. Knox and her chauffeur took down to the Gloversville train station 
to pick up the club magazine editor and drive her back and show her the new factory and the new house and her new kitchen. That car cost $180,000 in today's money. The title of the General Federation Club magazine article about Mrs. Knox was a progressive woman. And this was because of her employee policies and her business practices, not her national politics. When she took over the factory, she closed the back door and she had all the employees and the customers and management enter through the front door, famously saying, we are all ladies and gentlemen here. She gave all employees two weeks paid vacation, unlimited sick leave, and time off to go to the doctor, which I think some people today would still love to have. Right. Um, the article discussed her beautiful home and kitchen, her factory and its laboratories, all clean and gleaming and white. The 1914 articles on Mrs. Knox were then followed by a nationally syndicated article in 1915 that first ran in the New York Tribune. And so, you know, went all over. From that time until the last article about her, which ran in Colliers in 1949, one year before she died, Mrs. Knox was in the public eye. And evident from the beginning was the positioning she chose, which melded her role as housewife with her role as business president. One never detracted from the other. As Mrs. Knox said to the reporter, first I put up a building for the newspaper plant, then I built a new gelatin factory, and by that time I knew enough to build my new kitchen. <laughs> I love the attitude expressed by the, this female reporter, who I will read it because you can't read it, but quote, her age and position as a property widow with young married sons are those of the typical fat dowager much celebrated in fiction. But Mrs. Knox is neither fat nor a dowager. After seeing her, one wonders whether a course in expert accounting might not be a valuable addition to beauty shops. <laughs> Mrs. Knox defined herself with a message which was always the same throughout the years. I'm a wife, a mother, involved in my community via clubs and civic deeds, and I run a business. Any woman with quote unquote system can do it. It just takes hard work and consistent attention. And here, Mrs. Knox defines system as basically good time management. In some ways, the narrative that Mrs. Knox put forth was easy for the press to accept because so much of it, many of her actions and beliefs really matched the conception of an early 20th century, traditional white middle-class married woman. But in other ways, her message was really subversive. At a time when most professional women were trying to downplay their femininity, remain single to gain acceptance from men, wear uh, conservative looking clothes. Mrs. Knox said, I'm a traditional woman and I run a good profitable business. Of course, when she said she looked in her icebox every day before she went to the office, she did. But then she told one of her six staff working for her what to do. <laughs> Mrs. Knox did not go shopping herself. <laughs> However, she never talked about the hired help that made running a home and a business at the same time so much easier. Mrs. Knox was the only nationally known female business owner of that time that I can find who publicly embraced a white woman's traditional role along with her business role. And it's worth noting that her contemporary, her female contemporaries in business who publicly rejected that role received nowhere near the respect in the press that Mrs. Knox did. By 1922, Pictorial Review Magazine called her the most recognizable businesswoman in America. Now, in keeping with the traditional, she always credited her husband with her success, just as a good wife of that era should have done. This despite the fact that she completely changed his marketing strategy, his tactics, his mode of production, and his investment. She said she believed women should learn from their husbands so that they would be prepared to fend for themselves if they needed to, as she had. And she felt, quote, that business is by no means so intricate that it could not be grasped by study and common sense. Now, she truly believed that the training that a white middle class woman would receive if she systematically, ma systematically managed her home and budget would equip her for running a business. However, Mrs. Knox inherited her company. No one was ever going to fire her. Other women may have taken inspiration from her statements. But the opportunity to be hired and show their prowess would have been very different, especially once the depression came and marriage was a cause for to be fired immediately. Mrs. Knox was a strategic and an innovative marketer. 
When she inherited the company, as I've said, she shifted its focus to focus on the housewife instead of the grocer. And after 1915, she used her own public image to help build Knox gelatin into the number one unflavored consumer gelatin in the country. Knox's first signature ad campaign was Mrs. Knox Says, which she began in 1917, which was fully five years before General Mills invented Betty Proper. She used her Mrs. Knox Says, Says slogan consistently into the early 1920s. I'm a housewife just like you, and here's my advice. Actually, by the time she talked about herself as a housewife, she was a widow, her husband was dead, she was not cooking for her husband or her sons anymore, but she rarely used the word widow. Instead, she leveraged the social capital of her status as race. Women across the country wrote her, and they trusted her. Her ads consistently featured her recipes with the signature Knox box and a picture of the dishes. Their content reflected the times, so when the country went to war in 1917 and Herbert Hoover was encouraging women to practice thrift and food economy, she came out with a cookbook called Food Economy, which was endorsed by Hoover on page two as part of the Food Administration's efforts to encourage voluntary food rationing. Favorite one, one of the most popular recipes in food economy was the butter extender recipe, which used milk, cream, and Knox gelatin to turn one pound of butter into two pounds of butter for immediate use. <laughs> Other recipes showed how gelatin could help turn leftovers into a tasty dinner mold and meal. At the time, you always started by soaking your gelatin in water or milk or consomme, and then you heated the mixture until the gelatin was completely dissolved. Well, one fact, fun fact, gelatin absorbs five to 10 times its weight in water to form its gel. It can be heated and reheated. Um, it's best kept at 39 degrees, and if you freeze it, it will degrade it. By the 1920s, Mrs. Knox promoted a wide variety of recipes beyond just desserts. She added recipes for salads and what were called savories, which are dishes that at least supposedly were not sweet and were more appropriate for luncheons or dinners. We're looking. Anyway, 25% um, of the recipes in Knox's 1924 cookbook were for salads or savories, and by 1929, that number was 33%. So it's summer. I thought you might enjoy looking at two summer recipes in a little more depth. Uh, first, the fruit soup, ideal for the simple, simple summer luncheon. Melt gelatin and water, combine with fruit juice, sugar, and some lemon juice, garnish with fruit, and serve with unsweetened crackers. Okay, that's pretty simple. For dinner, especially with leftovers, there was cold meat in aspen. <laughs> to make it, you layered the aspen, alternating your gelatin, which you'd mix with consomme, with decorative vegetables and slices of meat. Now, the layering concept is really important in Knox's dishes, so I thought I'd go through her general instructions. And here, when she writes the word jelly, she means flavored jelly. So you dip the vegetable garnish whether you're using a carrot or a beef or whatever it is, into the cool liquid jelly. And you press it well down into the bottom of the mold, which has been rinsed in cold water. When firm, you pour the cool jelly in very carefully. If there's to be a garnish between two layers of jelly of different colors, then wait until the first layer is becoming firm, but not quite set. Arrange your garnish on this after dipping it into more liquid jelly and allow that to become firm before adding another layer. Other mold hints in her cookbooks include one for double gelatin molds. For this, you need to imagine two molds. First, you're taking the larger bowl and you're putting it on ice and you are pouring liquid jelly in to form the foundation. When that's firm, you're taking a smaller mold and you're putting it on top of that foundation, filling that with ice, pouring the liquid jelly in between the space in between the two molds. When that's set, you carefully remove the ice with a spoon from the smaller mold, you pour a little warm water in, and you quickly take the smaller mold out, leaving a space to be filled with some cream or fruit. You use contrasting colors. You smooth the surface of the filling, allowing it to become firm before pouring on the remaining jelly, which completely encases the entire thing in jelly. <laughs> or, this is the simple way, Fill the entire mold with pure liquid jelly. When firm with a warm spoon, dip out sufficient of the center to leave space desired for filling, in this case, strawberries and whipped cream. 
Well, how did Mrs. Knox advertise all of these recipes in the early 1920s? She combined them with a pitch for gelatin for health. Vitamin A had been discovered in 1912. Vitamins B, C, D, and E were all discovered in the next 10 years. The discovery of vitamins and their benefit for health dovetailed with a new emphasis by doctors, the government, school, and the press to make sure that women were educated about the role that food could play in a family's health. And there we go. Literally, um, oh, I can leave it that one. Literally, one third of the men who were examined by their draft boards for World War I got rejected because they were not physically fit. So the government was support, supporting home demonstration agents, agricultural colleges, and home economics teachers to teach women what a nutritious menu might look like. And by the early 1920s, Mrs. Knox had shifted her ads from Mrs. Knox Says to focusing on gelatin for health. This change also took Mrs. Knox out of the personality arena. Now that Betty Crocker and a whole lot of other women were in the personality arena, gelatin is 95% protein. So the company was marketing Knox as a valuable protein to help the woman in her role as primary caregiver for their family and their health. The company promoted gelatin, as, an, as you can see here, an important ingredient in infant formula and a way to help children get their nutrients and grow big and strong. You could get children to eat their vegetables and eat their fruit and eat their meat if you put it in a nice pretty mold. You could put gelatin in milk to make it easier on an infant's stomach so that the milk would stay down and they could regurgitate it. You could make all sorts of molds and attractive dishes for um, invalids to induce them to have the milk or the vegetables that they needed to eat. And Knox was high on the amino acid called lysine, which we now know today plays a role in calcium absorption and helps build muscle protein. So the company funded tens of thousands of dollars of medical research, literally, to document gelatin's nutritional value to infants, children, and convalescents. And then it published recipe books, not just dainty desserts, but recipe books for, dietetic, for, for diabetics, for people with gastric problems, or for people with tuberculosis. Knox's positioning did certainly serve to differentiate Knox gelatin from other flavored gelatin desserts like baby jello. Knox's research then turned into the night, what I call the 1920s equivalent of today's influencer campaigns. Each year, the company mailed literally millions of letters, booklets, and cookbooks to not only housewives, but to those who influenced mothers, using the Knox Bureau of Home Economics and later its Food Education Bureau to send its research to the teachers of home economics classes in elementary schools, high schools, and colleges, and to nurses and doctors, women's clubs, and home demonstration agents. Each one of those was signed by Mrs. Knox. Edward Bernays, called the father of public relations, managed the Knox PR in the late 1920s. He managed Beach Nuts PR in the early 1920s. If she had not been before, by 1928, Mrs. Knox was certainly a household name. Vitamins were not the only change women were encountering as they thought about what foods to make for their family. The refrigerator was invented in 1927. And Knox put out the, for its first electric refrigerator cookbook in 1929, even though into the early 1930s, only about 7% of households in the country owned electric refrigerators. So why'd she do that? Well, perhaps part of the reason that she published a cookbook so early was that all of a sudden, there were home economists who'd been hired at utility companies and all these new refrigerator companies, and they were ready to promote Knox gelatin. Why? because hot weather recipes with jello were considered ideal ways to demonstrate the value of an electric refrigerator. <laughs> so Knox sent out hundreds of the thousands of these electric refrigerator cookbooks. Besides mailings and lectures and advertising, Mrs. Knox gave regular syndicated radio broadcasts. She'd started doing so in 1923 from Schenectady, where GE had one of its, the first radio stations, WGY. The broadcast emphasized the many uses of gelatin in cooking, its helpful properties, and Mrs. Knox's own position as president of the company. Now, I have a brief sample for you that I'm going to play. It was broadcast in 1932. Mrs. Knox had recorded an address to the National Retail Grocers Association Convention, which her son Jim, vice president of the company, was attending. 
And it was broadcast across the country as she also spoke to the Housewives of America about how wonderful their local grocery was. Take a brief listen. Let's see. Weeks they just why this convention is being held. As a housewife who buys food from the booster and a businesswoman who sells the booster, it is my happy privilege to see both sides of the picture. Here we go, both sides of the picture. <laughs> Through the 1920s, Mrs. Knox actively ran the company. Her son Jim managed the trade side of the business. He traveled the country selling gelatin to grocers and to food brokers. Jim had started helping her in 1923, I'm sorry, in 1913, when he was 21. Unfortunately, he was also an alcoholic and his attention to the business was erratic. He kept pet chimpanzees and a pet bear cub sometimes too. <laughs> Mrs. Knox was the public face of the company to the women of America and its marketing and strategic brain. She also says she signed all the checks till 1947. She talked a lot about the importance of delegating, but she actually really always had her finger on everything that was going on. However, in the 1930s, as she entered her mid-70s, because remember, she took over the company when she was 50, her son Jim began to direct more of Knox's marketing and strategy. And he switched the advertising emphasis from gelatin for health to gelatin to please a man. Ads used a movie screen storyboard type format called dramatic realism that intensified everyday problems becoming personal in a different way than before, with taglines like, that's why I'm sporting a new coat. What you can see is her husband had brought home his boss for dinner and the boss loved the gelatin dessert. Um, or the other one, which is trouble at the Allens, which was solved when my grocer told me that his mother used Knox gelatin to make dessert and now my husband really is happy. Many advertisers use this approach, but no, Knox's ads also still have the recipes in them. Jim also tried emphasizing the protein qualities of Knox by doing research with the Notre Dame and other football teams on how Knox might help increase endurance uh, or give your husband energy because he's getting tired. Um, <laughs> however, in 1941, the FDA forced the company to bow out of that health plan as it ruled that gelatin did not materially improve energy, nor while they were looking at it, did it help infant feeding, nor was it an ideal food for diabetics. <laughs> Scientific understanding of the properties of proteins had advanced beyond Knox's earlier, more simplistic analysis and research. Researchers now knew that while uh, gelatin was 95% protein, it did not contain one of the amino acids essential for human nutrition. So while Knox's great and its coagulating features that can make molds, it can't support human, it cannot support human energy needs. Though its lysine does help with muscle building, and Knox is consumed in large quantities by some bodybuilders today. The company moved on to diversify into other areas. In the 1930s, the company hired researchers to investigate gelatin's uses by doctors as a clotting agent, which led to a new product which was endorsed and adopted by the US military and stockpiled in, as a stopgap for use in case of an atomic war. This product was called Knox P20, and it used gelatin as a hemostatic agent. It was tested in the China Burma War at the end of World War II, and today there is a gelatin-based clotting uh, product on the market. Knox's gelatin factory in uh, Camden also began to produce the gelatin that you now eat in your gel caps if you take your medicine in a, in a gel cap. And in case you're curious, the focus on Knox for nails, which a lot of people still remember, and dieting really didn't get big until the 1950s. Throughout the 1930s, Mrs. Knox continued to receive laudatory press coverage. She loved to travel, especially to spas, and when she did, she often gave interviews or met with food brokers. While Jim's business instincts were not always good, and the company did suffer financially in the mid-1930s, it recovered by the early 1940s. So what was Mrs. Knox like, like outside of work? Well, in Johnstown, besides bridge playing, she entertained regularly at her home. She threw parties and fundraisers for up to 200 people on her lawn, in her house, in her barn, or in its early days in her factory. This picture is from a gathering in her garden, probably of the General Federation of Women's Clubs in Johnstown, which she founded and ran for over 25 years. Or perhaps it was the local business and professional women's club of which she was an active member. 
On a smaller level, she attended the First Presbyterian Church regularly, belonged to the Burroughs Nature Club, and as I mentioned earlier, the Aldine Study Club. And her clubs and community must have been a source of unending support and positive affirmation for her. An active philanthropist in town, her priorities were children, physical fitness, and religion. In 1930, during the height of the Depression, she gave a 15-acre athletic field to the Johnstown Schools, athletic field complex to the Johnstown Schools. It included ball fields for baseball and football, tennis courts and a track, bleachers for 1,000 people in a town of 11,000 people, night lights, and a full field house. It cost the equivalent of $4 million in today's money, and it is still being used today. She gave church bells to three churches, built rooms at the AME Church, a swimming pool and a bowling alley for the Y, and was president of the board of the Willing Helpers Home for Aged Women, which she and her husband uh, founded in 1907 and which just closed its doors this past Christmas. Mrs. Knox's community involvement, however, was apolitical. She had said she did not believe in suffrage. However, she did register to vote as a Republican the first minute she could, which was in 1918, when women got the vote in New York State. The exposure and positive acceptance that Mrs. Knox received due to Knox's popularity and her astute positioning as a community-involved housewife and businesswoman kept her in the news. By 1937, the New York World Telegram called her the biggest woman industrialist in the country, with the New York Times adding in 1939 that despite her position, quote, as a woman industrialist on a major scale, she would not trade the friendliness and esteem of Johnstown, New York, for the admiring recognition of all this land. <laughs> this picture of Mrs. Knox in her kitchen comes from a series of photos that Life Magazine shot on her 80th birthday, when her party was the three-page feature in Life Goes to a Party in its December 1937 issue. Finally, in 1947, when she was 90 years old, Mrs. Knox gave her son Jim the presidency title. She died in 1950. Her son Jim ran the company for six years, and then he turned it over to his son John, who ran it until 1972, when he sold the company to Lipton. Though the New York Times had heralded Mrs. Knox in 1939, they did not give her an obituary. Women who ran businesses really were an aberration and their heritage could be and was ignored. However, she left two important legacies. First, this is going to be the favorite of one person in this audience, the enduring gelatin mold and its many uses. Commemorated here by the popular Facebook group, which you can find, which is Asmix with Threatening Horrors. <laughs> these pictures, these pictures are just from the last month's worth of posting. So you can post their, their, their pictures. Wow. The second and very important legacy, and really why I'm interested in this, is Mrs. Knox's example to the female CEOs who immediately followed her. She figured out how to get respect as a business executive. The formula was to embrace the late 19th and early 20th century women's traditional roles of home, child and husband care, and community involvement, and add to that running a business without ever talking about the support it required, the trade-offs that she'd made, or the difficulties of doing it all. And she said, quote, every woman is forced can do much more in a diversified way than she thinks she can do. And I submit we're still living with that legacy and expectation today. So thank you all very much. Um, please sign the contact sheet, which I think Rebecca has, if you want to be kept informed about more talks or um, publication release. And um, thank you.